I want to speak about confidence and bodhicitta, this Sanskrit word which means um, the mind heart of awakening, the mind heart that is on the path of waking up and wants to support others to wake up. And as I mentioned at the beginning, this book that recently came out that I wrote, We Were Made for These Times, in an interview, uh, I'll put in the chat if, you're, um, if you'd like more information about it so you can uh, see, see how to, to learn about it. Um, that's my website with, with information about the book. Um, so when I, I was doing an interview about the book with um, Pamela Ayo Yatunde from the Lion's Roar, uh, she's an editor there, and she was she started off saying, you know, your book is really about confidence. There's a lot in this, a lot of confidence coming through in the title. We were made for these times, and I hadn't hadn't quite um, had that reflected back to me in that way before. Um, but it really is confidence is a foundational mind heart state to cultivate in our practice, especially in these times. And so bodhicitta is about that. It's about claiming that I'm here to do something and it's important. I came here and I matter and this time that I have on this planet is precious and I have something to contribute. And it's this sense of aspiration, right? That um, we need to find some kind of container that will hold what we have to give, right? For many folks, that container for where they can pour themselves into, you know, it could be many different things. It could be their family, it could be their work, it could be their spiritual practice, it could be some land that they really take good care of. Um, so there's a, a, a phrase in one of the chants that I chanted a lot as a nun um, that says, once I have a path, I have nothing more to fear. So once I have a, a way to give myself to life, right? Once I have a, a sense of my direction and where I really want to contribute, you know, then I have nothing more to fear. So that's that sense of confidence. Um, and this can be so uh, powerful in terms of giving us a direction in our lives, even when things become difficult. So I have a friend, I lived in Sri Lanka for two years recently, and I have a friend there who is a refugee there. He sort of escaped from his country, which was not an open country where anyone who wanted to could get a passport and travel wherever they wanted. Um, and so because of the different kinds of persecution he faced in that country, he he falsified a passport because that was the only way he could get out of the country or you know in a neighboring country he did that and then he was en route to where his family lived in another country but had to pass through sri lanka anyway they they put him in prison because of this false passport and luckily he met uh, some wonderful young lawyers uh, at that time uh, who were able to get him out of prison and get him refugee status because of the conditions in his country. So I met him, you know, as he was living his life in Sri Lanka and um, he had fallen in love with a woman also from his country, but who was living in this other country where his family was and 
she came to Sri Lanka and they got married and uh, they had a child. She, she came back to where she, she's living now and had her, their baby. He's still in this limbo of not being able to join his wife, his son, his, the rest of his family. And especially with COVID now, it probably will take you know, even longer than it would have normally taken for him to be resettled. But I stay in touch with him, and he has a very strong faith. He's Catholic. He, he has a very deep prayer life, and he never is down about his situation. Like, it's always an inspiration to me to see how, how happy he is in spite of all of the pain he is experiencing all the time by being separated from the people he loves so much. And he's not able to work there because he has refugee status. So many of his skills aren't able to be put, put to use, but he still finds a way. So he started translating um, spiritual teachers that he's inspired by into his native language. So I just, I, I feel he's such a wonderful example of this quality of of bodhicitta, this um, the mind heart of awakening, and it so demonstrates the power of the mind, um, and and how powerful our our intention can be. Like once we once we get in touch with what it is we really want for our lives, that can carry us through so many things that are difficult. So I listened to a Dharma talk by um, Thupten Dongdrub, a Tibetan monk on the potential of mind. And he shared that the mind is the one thing that doesn't decay and can't be destroyed. Unlike so many things that are impermanent that we can't take with us from one life to the next though. It's perfectly fine if you're not subscribing to that idea of reincarnation or multiple life lifetimes. The mind, he says, is pure and powerful. It keeps whatever we invest into it and faithfully returns this investment back to us. So nothing we do to cultivate our mind in the direction of freedom and compassion is ever wasted. So that's this power of our mind to be such a loyal container, (laughs) Uh, 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 such a rich, fertile ground for the wholesome seeds that we are cultivating. So we can all use our time wisely to invest in ourselves and in our minds. The mind is so precious, the mind heart, right? Because in many traditions where Buddhism came from in Asia, the the word we use in English as mind is actually mind heart in those Asian languages. So the mind heart is very precious and our human life is very precious. And each day we can do something to help the Buddha in us, the the divine, the God, the, the Christ in us manifest more fully. Especially now when there's lots of uncertainty and the pandemic continues into its second year It's a very precious opportunity to cultivate our minds, to invest in our hearts, in our bodies, in our potential. So there's a sutra that the Buddha offered called the Sutra on the Four Nutriments, Four Kinds of Food. Um, I'm going to speak about the fourth, but I'll just tell you what they all are. The first one is edible food, so food and drink. The second nutriment is sense impression food. So the things we take in through our senses, like magazines, books, films, video games, posters, um, what we see on the internet, what we hear, what we, what we touch, what 
you know, conversations. So that, that's sense impression food. The third kind of food, uh, that's the one I want to talk about, not the fourth, is volition or intention. So um, what drives us, what gets us out of bed in the morning because we want to accomplish something or we have some duty that we feel responsible to fulfill. Um, and the last of the four nutriments is consciousness. So it's the food of our, of our, um, the thoughts, the memories, the things we bring up from our consciousness, which can be our individual consciousness as well as our collective consciousness. So this third kind of food, which is the food of volition, intention, it gives us energy to either bring about wholesome actions or unwholesome ones. And it's an underlying force that drives our lives. So we really want to ask, where is it taking us? Where is our intention, our volition taking us in our life? Because if we don't investigate, if we don't look at it clearly, what kind of food we're consuming in terms of our intention, our volition, then we might be taken hostage by others' volitions, right? Like if a child ends up living out its life, fulfilling the dreams of, it, of their parent, that's our own volition, our own life force being taken over by someone else's volition. But it can also happen collectively where we are in this kind of stuck place trying to fulfill society's sense of what the vol vol volition that we should have or that our community collectively should have in terms of being successful, that our true identity is being a consumer, that we make meaning in our life through material things. So that might be our volition being taken over by the collective volition. So if if our lives are focused on attaining things that don't bring true happiness and true freedom, we can change course. We, that's why it's important to stay attuned to what is it that I'm really deeply concerned about beneath the surface of my life. And if we don't keep checking in and keep kind of correcting course, uh, then we may go far away from from our real purpose. So, so bodhicitta, this, this aspiration to awaken and help others wake up from delusions, from suffering, it's the mind of awakening, the mind of love, and it is a tremendous source of energy. It's what led the Prince Siddhartha on his path of awakening for the benefit of countless beings where he went through many hardships and he kept going because he knew there's something really important I have to do, not just for myself. This energy of bodhicitta is what motivated people like Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, Harriet Tubman, Mother Teresa. It's what's motivating millions of people a little bit everywhere right now who are committed to helping others and transforming our societies in this time of great challenge, great peril. So when we live in accord with our purpose, when we live in right relationship to the whole, we are held, we're protected in some way, and we can experience trust in the whole and trust in ourselves. So there are many stories I'm sure that we all know of how people have maintained their humanity in the midst of inhumane conditions. And that shows us how trustworthy and powerful our authentic truth is, how trustworthy life is. And so one story that I'll share with you is of a Franciscan friar um, in Poland during World War II by Maximilian Kolbe. 
He was captured and taken to a concentration camp for his activities with the resistance. And he reminded us that it is often in the darkest places that light can shine at its brightest. So in 1941, when a prisoner escaped from the concentration camp he was in, as a punishment and and to discourage future escape attempts, the head of the concentration camp randomly chose 10 men to be killed by starvation. As the guards picked out the last of the 10 victims, the man chosen cried out in agony, saying that he had a wife and eight children and that there would be no one to care for them once he was killed. Hearing that and moved by his words, Friar Kolba stepped forward and said that he had no wife and no children and that it was he who should be killed instead of the father of eight. The Nazi officer agreed to Friar Kolba's offer and he was thrown into a cell with the other nine men and told laughingly that he and the others would wither away like so many tulips. And when after two weeks of starvation he was still alive, he was given a lethal injection. Friar Kolba accepted his sentence calmly, and he died while praying, knowing that suffering for love feeds love. The guard who went to posthumously examine his body reported that it was glowing with a strange light and that the cell was filled with the peace of holiness. So, so this is a story of bodhicitta, of someone whose sense of their path was so clear that they could die in these horrible conditions with a clear mind, with a peaceful heart, with love, with love in their heart. And So bodhicitta gives us this courage, gives us this trust. And this is a trust knowing that there is something in me and around me that is trustworthy. And that's what we were doing in the meditation. We were in touch with a part of our being that can hold much more than we think we're capable of. So there's a version of the Mahayana Bodhisattva vow, and it goes like this. The many beings are numberless. I vow to save them. Greed, hatred, and ignorance rise endlessly. I vow to abandon them. Dharma gates are countless. I vow to wake to them. The Buddha's way is unsurpassed. I vow to embody it fully. And Robert Aitken talks about, this is a Zen teacher, talks about how in the beginning, students will commonly ask, how can we honestly vow these things? Because it's impossible. It sounds, he says, like missionary arrogance. I'm going to save everyone. And Hui Neng, one of the patriarchs in Chinese, lineage offers this response. He says, you're saving them in your own mind. So bodhicitta, when we cultivate it, we're cultivating our own aspiration for wisdom and compassion and our determination to practice it in the world as best we can. So So it's so important to give space, to give time for what it is that we really want, even if it's still manifesting, even if it's still hidden. We all need to do this collectively. Imagine what is the world that we really want? Because we're, we often manifest a world that we don't want, you know?
So a friend of mine in the UK, Sophie Banks, she was an integral part of the transition town movement. This was a movement to make towns, communities, fossil fuel free. And it spread to thousands of communities around the world that have taken on this uh, model of a transition town, transitioning to renewable energy in food and housing and transportation. In the beginning of their organizing, when they focused on what they didn't want, when they met and talked about all the things that were wrong, that they didn't want, they had no energy. They were drained. They were tired. They were irritable. But when they realized, actually, let's focus on what we do want, that was completely different. They had so much energy. They had so much inspiration. When they started dreaming together, when they started visioning, that's the energy of bodhicitta. It's like, I know there's something that I really need to do. That wakes me up in the morning. That makes me stay up if I need to stay up past my bedtime. <laughs> I'm here past my bedtime, by the way. <laughs> but it gives us this energy. So that's that. Once I have a path, I have nothing more to fear. So it removes fear. It gives us vision. It gives us direction. That's how I felt when I first found the practice and the, the, the clear ethical principles of the Dharma path. I felt like, oh, I've been looking for this for my whole life. Like I had literally been thirsting for this. And it felt so good. Like, oh, now I have, I have what I need, this path, right? So, so what would it mean for us to have and to make, to create space, to vision how things might be different for us as individuals and as communities in, in the wake of this pandemic, right? This, this pandemic is still raging in many places, but as we think about where we want to be collectively, this is an amazing time of great pain, but also of possibility to to reassess how are we living and what kind of society do we really want, right? So, I wanna make sure we have time for questions, but I'll just end with a short story that's an example also of bodhicitta, which is really about examining how we live to see if it's the way we want to look back at our life. Right? So Thai, my teacher Thich Nhat Hanh, he often taught that we should live our life in such a way that we create a beautiful past. And so once as a nun, I was traveling with a sister and two brothers. We went to South Africa to lead retreats. We went to Botswana. And we, as we were heading there, we had a few hour layover in Johannesburg before our next flight. So we decided to have a meeting about what we needed to do on this trip. And one of the monks who was on the trip with us was of Vietnamese ancestry, and he was quite a tea master. So before we began planning, he wanted to serve us tea. So he pulled out this very fragile clay teapot, small, four little glass cups, teacups, and a thermos. He'd gotten boiled water. And then this loose leaf green tea, like a jasmine scented tea. All of this seemed so impractical to me to bring on such a long journey. It's so breakable. I was like, oh, I'll just bring a tea bag. That's all I would. So, but he filled the thermos and then he first washed the tea and then he warmed all the glasses with hot water. Finally, he steeped the tea and then he poured us each a small glass. And it was so fragrant and so delicious. 
And this special ritual made all of us slow down and savor this moment of being together. And so we moved from being kind of harried and, uh, you know, urgent about our work to, to just enjoying each other, laughing, relaxing as we sipped our tea. And so he continued to serve us in this beautiful, mindful way before every meeting we had on this trip. And we would enjoy our pause and our time to connect and just be together. And it always brought us closer. It made our work smoother and easier. So at the end of the trip, we finally had a day to just play. Our friends took us on a hike through the forest to a waterfall. And it was so beautiful. So we swam across this forest pool um, because we wanted to climb up the waterfall on the other side. And I noticed uh, as we were swimming, this brother had one hand holding his bag on his head and the, with only one hand he was swimming. And I couldn't imagine why. And so once we got to the other side, we climbed up these huge boulders, maybe like 50 feet up, so we could, all the way to the top of the waterfall, we could see all around. We sat down on this big, large rock, and, and suddenly out came the clay teapot and the thermos full of boiled water and these four teacups. And there, right on the top of this mountain, he served us delicious tea. And uh, every time I think of this story, I, I, I smile and I feel the joy all over again, the surprise, um, uh, this feeling of being like royalty, like someone serving tea in this way. So, so that's for me a, a really beautiful memory and reminder that we can live in such a way that we create a beautiful past. So even in times of hardship, times of transition, times of change, we can look for ways to bring joy and delight to ourselves and others in the present so that we create a beautiful past. We can remember what we're grateful for. And even in the midst of great trouble, we can find what is not going wrong. So that is another expression of bodhicitta, it's living deeply, um, taking, taking great love in, in how we interact with, with others. So I thank you for your kind attention. And we can take some 15 or so minutes for your questions, your reflections. And um, I see that, Jesse, you have your hand raised, so please go ahead. You can unmute yourself, or do I need to, let's see, I'll ask you to unmute. No? Hello. Hi. Yes, hi. 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 So, um, sorry that I put my hand up so early. I, I, I thought the questions were after the break. So uh, I just love the photo of Chai behind you. That's lovely. I'm hoping to go to Deer Park this this next year. <laughs> um, and my, my, I just love the title of your book. I really look forward to reading it, of course, with my big pile of other mindfulness books that I want to read. Um, and I my question is around... Um, challenging times and impermanence. So I, I have had a really difficult two years um, where impermanence has become very real. And that's helpful in a way. Marriages end, mothers die in car accidents, and daughters leave home. And it's hard when it's all in two years. And so in the past, impermanence felt kind of really like relieving, like, oh, this is hard, but it'll change, you know. But in all of this, in two years with COVID, it's almost like the permanence of hardship in a way. And so that's why I was like, oh, I love the title of her book. I'm sure there'll be some good reflections there for me. So I just wanted to 
Yeah, maybe you'll have a little insight for me now, and then I can read the fuller details in your book. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. I'm really sorry to hear about... Um, that's a lot, what you described. And um, I think the, the real place to put our our hearts in a time of so much loss, like you said, just permanent hardship is, is in really caring for ourselves and giving ourselves space to feel the loss and really honor that that has its own process and when it's so compressed when so many things have jolted us in a short amount of time plus this huge jolt to the whole human species in the backdrop um, you know to me what it really gives us a chance to do is also get in touch with our capacity to endure. <laughs> not, not very attractive as a, as a quality, but you know, um, one story that Ty shared is that when he was exiled from Vietnam, for calling for peace, he was his life was in danger, so he couldn't actually go back. And then his passport, his citizenship was canceled. So he was a refugee in Europe, and he lost all of you know the work he was doing, the friendships, you know the places he loved. He couldn't go back for forty four years. He was exiled. He couldn't go back. But he said that experience of exile, you're in a kind of exile, you could say right from those you know who were very close to you he said that experience of exile allowed him to find his true home inside of himself <laughs> that's, that's beautiful, beautiful. Thank, thank you, you. <laughs> I, I i just want to also just thank, thank you for you reminding us about the power of having an intention and i also am a brain injury survivor and i teach mindfulness to other brain injury survivors beautiful and that that picks me up every day mm, beautiful thank you so much jesse and just surrounding you with lots of love and care and kindness mm. And your raised hand was right on time. Lots of love for you in the chat as well. So does anyone else have a reflection question? Rachel, okay, go ahead. Oh, let's see. Sorry, I need to invite you to unmute. There you go. I just got unmuted. You know, a little bit of your talk was kind of reflecting on, you know, kind of finding your, your not your destiny, but, you know, kind of what you came here to do. Yeah. And, you know, I struggle with that. And I was wondering if you had any comments regarding that. Sure, sure. Would you mind to say just a teeny bit more, Rachel, about what you 
struggle with? Is it figuring out what it is your purpose is or? Uh, yeah, you know, yeah, I used to have a different life. I had a career and, you know, I sort of had that life. I worked as an RN for 20 years and then I was unable to continue doing that work and then I just sort of just kind of never found my niche after that. And so, you know, I raised a family and things. You know, I've never felt like I found some deeper calling in Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for sharing a little more. Um, one, one way I think it can be helpful to think of this question is just to come down to the question of what is it that you love? What is it that you want to protect? What is it that you care deeply about? It doesn't need to be a big, you know, like, I'm going to save the rainforest, or I, you know, um, want to end hunger worldwide. But it might be like, I really care about this one place near where I live. Or I really um, love elderly people. I want to make sure that they have what they need. Maybe it's right in your environment. Maybe it's an online group. Maybe. So, so I think kind of connecting with that sense of something you loved as a child, something that you, maybe, you know, we can also ask for guidance from the world around us through images, through symbols, through sounds. Like maybe there's an image that you were attracted to as a child or as a young person that's has kept repeating in your life. That could be a clue, you know, of like what, trajectory is yours or maybe it's a song or maybe it's a poem or maybe it's a dance or a lake or a stream or you know a place you went to as a child these are things that could hold pieces of the puzzle of like oh i think because there's usually a thread so maybe you know um even if you couldn't continue your career as an RN, what was it about being an RN that felt good to you, that felt purposeful, that felt like you were maybe fulfilling what you were here to do? And once you connect with those qualities, what are ways that you might continue to live out those qualities in your life now in different ways? But, you know, allowing that to still have expression through you. So is that, um, does that land at all for you? Uh, it, it, it does, does. <laughs> uh, on some mm -hmm. level. Uh, but like, like I said, it's, it's just, just always a bit of a struggle for me to find my niche, niche in life. Uh, uh, you know, uh, now that my kids have kind of grown up and, and moved on and... and <laughs> So anyway, but yeah, I love yeah. And you know, the question of it can be as powerful as any answer, like really living into the question of like, where is my niche? Where am I supposed to be? Um, and especially if you have any inkling of some part of you that got left behind or that had to be put down that was important to you, but that you couldn't nourish for whatever reason, just, just have that as a question, you know? And, uh, yeah, it's a journey. It's a journey to, and there may be many, many different paths that we take, right? So maybe there's a new one that's on its way and it's, you're in the process of, of finding it. Mm -hmm. Well, I think yeah. COVID in particular because I'm going to stay home. Have a little people like a lot of people have. You know, that kind of kind of probably, probably aggregate, maybe aggregate that that thought a little bit more. more, 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 more. <laughs> sure, everyone's so isolated, right? Yeah, 
it's it's what you're touching into is what a lot of people are touching into in in different ways yeah for sure yeah, yeah, yeah. and i know like, like, like we've come out of this you know we're in this constant run you know i know just what's going on with this you know better stronger yeah 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 great thank you thank you yeah, wish wish you well in, in that journey. Yeah. Um, so the question was about finding finding their uh, the person's niche and finding their purpose. That was the question. Um, and just to point out to you that someone wrote in the chat, "Finding your why." I think that's a book. I guess. Um, this is a, a helpful resource they're recommending. Um, so I think we should close uh, this portion of our evening and uh, so that you all have time for, for those who wish to stay on and have a discussion. So I will say a deep thank you and deep joy to be with each of you tonight. Thank you so much for having me as a guest teacher tonight. It's been a real pleasure. I'm happy to stay up <laughs> past my bedtime. <laughs> You've given me a lot of energy. So um, if you want to stay in touch with me, my website is my name, kyrajewel.com. I send out newsletters every so often with my upcoming events. Um, I will be starting also next year a group for Buddhists and Christians. Um, my partner is an Episcopal priest, so we'll be um, leading a monthly group to explore Buddhist Christian action practice study. So there's information about that on my website. Um, but I'm happy to stay in touch with you if you would like that. And um, Thank you for your warm welcome here tonight and really wish you um, much fruit and much um, beauty in your practice and the deepening of your practice. So um, thank you so much.